As speaker, we have Javier uh, Vicedo, who is the EASA representative, and he will give us a quite different view of how EASA is seen to approach the um, certification of uh, electric aircraft and EV tolls. Welcome to the stage. Before I start with the work of the agency in this domain of in flight, I wanted to remind the audience that early this year, the European Union and China signed a bilateral aviation safety agreement and an annex in the worthiness. Uh, this uh, was a key milestone in relations between Europe and China in aviation. And I take the opportunity to thank uh, Deji Xu and his team, as well as all CAC, for your support and personal involvement. Thank you. Looking back at this work, I also would like to thank uh, European and Chinese uh, stakeholders and industry, uh, both operators and manufacturers. Um, cooperation between Europe and China in aviation started roughly 50 years ago, and this is something you all ought to be proud of. The bridges you have built throughout these years remain a strong motivation for strengthening the ties between authorities, and I sincerely hope that you recognize your work in this agreement that I just mentioned, and the progress of our own cooperation in general. Um, this event comes at a very good time. Uh, with this high-level agreement now achieved, we continue to pursue things in which Europe and China can continue working together and uh, new technologies and new challenges are things we both face at the same time. So certainly are food for thought for future cooperation. Um, <clears throat> for my presentation today, I will be sharing with you some developments in the regulatory environment that we in Europe will continue to push forward to support this field and the emergence of electric um, and hybrid aviation. More specifically, I will touch upon our recent work on a couple of uh, initiatives to facilitate urban air mobility. An area which is capturing the imagination of many uh, inside and outside this room. I do not want to dwell too much uh, with the role of a regulatory agency. Um, I don't think it's the, it's the time. Uh, I just want to remind you uh, that despite how, however, different countries will organize themselves, we all have a duty to have a framework that can ensure safety, a level playing field, and that sustains innovation. We have all seen examples of what the future of air mobility will look like, and we at EASA are determined not to be an obstacle as long as we can fulfill our key mandate within that framework. That's fast. That was me. Sorry. How do I go back? Okay. Um, looking at the concepts now being explored, uh, many of you here uh, exploring, we often find two common um, denominators. One is electric propulsion or hybrid, and other, perhaps less often, we find vertical takeoff and landing. At the agency, that's exactly how we're working. Um, providing a comprehensive set of regulations that can cover both these aspects. For this, I wanted to share with you today uh, this work, one being the issuance of a special condition on vertical takeoff and landing, 
as well as work on our future radiation for electric and hybrid propulsion, which we are looking to support with this, looking to support precisely this vertical takeoff and landing. So when it comes to the vertical takeoff and landing, let me get this right. There we go. Okay. So EASA this last year has reviewed more than 150 vertical takeoff and landing configurations, all different stages of maturity, but all aiming to address a potential new market. This show a wide variety of configurations with limited common characteristics, except for VTOL capability. All of them share this capability, all one thing looking at vertical takeoff and landing, and of the distributed propulsion. So, despite having design characteristics of airplanes, rotorcraft, or both, in, mo in most cases, EASA was not able to classify these new vehicles as either being conventional airplanes or conventional helicopters, as covered by our specific regulations. So, if we had applied those existing regulations, depending on whether they are these machines are airplanes for rotorcraft, um, and adding new modifications, it would have probably been somehow unfair for patients. So these new types of vehicles are, at the end, designed to address the same new market. Even not always the same segments. So the agency's opinion was that it would not be fair to treat applicants differently based on the same regulatory starting point, CS23 or CS27, that I put there, as it would probably favor one configuration. And most importantly, it could prevent some very promising configurations from actually reaching its full potential. So this is why EASA developed this bit, the vertical takeoff and landing special condition, which is extensively based on CS23, so for normal category airplanes, but integrates elements of rotorcraft regulations when appropriate. This should enable a fair competition and clarity for future applicants. Um, about a year ago, we opened a public consultation on this. Some of you, I, I presume, uh, they even made uh, comments. We received hundreds, if not thousands, of comments, so it's a very popular uh, special condition proposal we made, and this has led to the last version of the final version, which was issued in uh, July, that photo actually says October, but the July one is already out, so the last one released in July. We are committed to ensuring the highest level of safety while providing lighter standards and promoting innovation, and we think that this, this text uh, will enable precisely that. So now, when it comes to applicability, this special condition uh, has been established to prescribe technical specifications for types of certifications of passenger carrying vertical takeoff and landing, <laughs> heavier than air, in the small category, with thrust or lift thr thrust units that are used to generate power lift and control. It's not just thrust units for power lift, but also for control. You'll see later, this is also an item that we are paying a lot of attention when it comes to our propulsion special condition. Um, <clears throat> the distinction from conventional aircraft is based on the veto capability. So, so see over there. So, when it's to go, a vertical takeoff and landing, then it moves to the right. And then, when more than two lift or thrust units are used to provide lift during takeoff and landing. It's a clear distinction, distinction from uh, rotorcraft regulation. So this special condition is, is intended to be compatible with remote piloting capability of different level, or different level of autonomy. However, I must say, uh, we are not yet there. So I put over there, uh, we still not, despite a lot of uh, concepts uh, coming out online and people promoting these things. Uh, we are not there yet in terms of remote uh, capability, so this special condition does not address this one. 
Um, so when it comes to scope, scope, so EASA has decided to set the scope of B12 up to the CS27 small rotorcraft. <laughs> Initially the proposal was uh, under 2,000 uh, kilos as you can see here and precisely because we just had a lot of the, the proposed uh, designs were uh, below that weight. However, feedback from our proposed special edition made us think about that it actually made sense to match it with CS27 so to have a common starting point. Um, in order of CS23, I'm oh, sorry, to go line CS23, um, in this special condition, namely basic and enhanced. Um, this links to the type of operations we mentioned earlier from the DDSU. Authorities are looking more at how you use your aircraft, not just what your aircraft are like, or the specifications per se, but how you, look, how you use them. So that's what we do. We learn, we learn from our own unmanned aircraft regulations, and now we are applying the same here. This link approach, uh, allows for proportionality in safety objectives and enables to apply the highest safety levels to the category enhanced to the, for the protection of third parties when flying over congested areas. The operational rules can then be built on demonstrated aircraft safety levels and adapted as necessary to local particularities. Vehicle aircraft that are certified in the category enhanced will have to meet requirements for continued safe flight, like we put here, continued safe flight um, after uh, and be able to continue to the original intended destination or a suitable alternative that vertiport after a failure. Whereas category basic, uh, only a controlled emergency landing is required. Um, the type of operations for the category enhanced uh, that, that this category will perform will correspond to the highest operational risk to third parties. So we will be paying a lot of attention and therefore the most stringent systems and safety objectives will be assigned regardless of the number of occupants. So <coughs> saw over there as well that we're looking up to nine passengers, by the way, forgot to mention, but doesn't matter if you only carry one passenger for a category enhanced, what we are looking also is the damage that could be caused to people, third parties. Now, so just wanted, that's my last slide for the VTOL, I just wanted to show a bit of an example um, of how we see things, this is just part of uh, the regulation. Some of you, by seeing this, uh, perhaps are reminded a bit of uh, ETOPS regulations. So, we take as an example on the air mobility platform scheduled to perform a 15 minute flight at 60 knots. Um, it assumes two different scenarios of battery failure. So our proposal uh, would require that platforms are available for any such diversion all throughout the trajectory. So if there is an accident or battery failure five minutes, then an alternative landing site should be accessible. If it's 10 minutes, then a different one, uh, a shorter distance, obviously, depending on the length of the amount of battery left. Um, this is just a, a little visual example for, of the type of rationale that we are applying. Um, also, some considerations, uh, much more detailed are in this, uh, is this working? Okay. Um, much more details can be found in the, in the vertical uh, take off and landing special condition. Uh, I presume many of them of you here have read it, but just wanted to share some thoughts in terms of performance data. So we are working mostly today with platforms uh, that are destined for cities at sea level, uh, cities in Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Those are cities where, if you look at the press, it's where more like air mobility is being discussed. Um, all these fancy things. One has to wonder, probably, why the people living there have more money. So it gives you the indication perhaps this product is going to be a bit expensive, but I leave it for you. Anyway, this is, uh, jokes aside, uh, the truth is that today a lot of these applications are being looked at this uh, sea level cities. Nevertheless, of course, we are also looking at uh, strange uh, other requirements for high altitude uh, performance as other operations are envisaged of it. When it comes to takeoff uh, performance inclining information, um, unlike 
previous regulations with helicopters, I mentioned this is uh, it's a combination. So we're also looking at different profiles for takeoff. Uh, we are aware that hovering is an expensive, energy expensive uh, maneuver, and thus uh, our regulation is also looking into how best to um, address this thing. Uh, controllability. Um, I think this is a, an important one. An important one. Um, so we want machines that are not difficult to control um, and that require exceptional piloting skills within the flight envelope. Um, and I see conditions as well. Um, I have right over there. Uh, when it comes to smaller uh, smaller first um, studies have demonstrated that icing conditions can be very, very harmful, unlike helicopters. So we are clearly looking uh, into that. And the structural durability, uh, we have uh, the past experience uh, has demonstrated that emphasis is needed when it comes to structural failures. Um, so we are we're proposing a couple of things. One is in service monitoring of parts that have an important uh, safety angle to the integrity. And also that for the category in Sonic enhanced, that a single failure cannot have a catastrophic effect on the aircraft. Um, and finally, just a couple of points. And when it comes to occupant safety, so uh, we are aware that some concepts are foreseeing dynamic surfaces very close to passengers. And we are placing extra emphasis on making sure that designs take uh, safety into consideration, uh, not just during flight, but also embarking, disembarking, and eventually in cases of emergency uh, evacuation uh, when needed. And also, um, the last one here, as well as many others, by the way, but fire protection. Uh, there's been some uh, accidents in the past where uh, fire after a crash uh, was the main cause of uh, <coughs> um, injuries and, and deaths, and this is also something that we are trying to address. So there are several more considerations in this proposed special conditions, and I encourage all of you to, to read it and make any suggestions you may have. Um, so again, um, my colleagues are always on addresses for this. Um, now, this is not a mistake. Uh, this is I put this on purpose. So this is our electronic and hybrid propulsion systems um, special condition. Um, it is like this because this is not yet finished, so I, we do not have yet, we have not yet issued our proposed um, special condition. I mentioned earlier that at EASA we see urban air mobility having two main components. One is the VTOL angle to it, and of course coming closely with it is propulsion. We cannot just define a VTOL in which you kind of use normal engines, because I don't think any of you here is looking at that. This form is called e flight form for a reason, and they stands for something. So we are now working towards this. Um, don't take me at, at my word it's precisely, but I believe that the special condition should be issued at the end of the year. Okay, so keep a uh, close eye on this around this around in two, three months to be out. Um, so the motivation of this part, so the, the truth is that um, we have uh, a lot of, uh, we have been looking at this very closely ever since the first uh, request came. Uh, there is a clear challenge, uh, some of, many of you experts in certification. I mentioned earlier, and yesterday talking with my colleagues, uh, think about when we had a helicopter, it was a clear propulsion unit, and then we had the flight control. Aircraft are similar in that regard, so we have the engines, and then we have the flight control set. Each are certified separately. So we will have the certification for the propulsion on one side, but then the certification of flight control will be within the aircraft per se. Now, when you start putting um, engines or thrusts that also have control power over the machine, then that adds an additional level of complexity and reflection to authorities. And these are things that are today uh, we are looking at. Um, <clears throat> so. Today, projects are being dealt on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Um, now, we have some projects. We have started some projects. Uh, some of you perhaps involved um, some with some TACs, uh, technical advice contracts. Uh, CC stands for certification activities with us. 
in other such projects. And then as well, we are part of some standardization activities, as I'm sure many of you here are. Um, mentioned earlier, so we are using uh, existing material. Um, this is a, a bit of what uh, you have there already out, not just by ASA, but also by other uh, stakeholders, particularly I mean, the standard bodies. So this is the material that we're taking into consideration when putting together this new regulation to make sure that, that everything matches and everything is covered appropriately. Um, when it came to this, the motivation be, behind uh, this, so you saw earlier we have plenty of different projects always on a case-by-case -case basis. Should not come as a surprise. We would like to have something that we can present to everybody at the same time and the basis of common denominator. Um, also, we are looking at, at support of other uh, stakeholders as well. Um, the objectives, um, you know, it has its mandate, or maybe you don't, but it has its mandate is not just around safety, describing our mandate is also environment. environment. Uh, so uh, for us, this is a very promising field which really goes with our agreement, and we are very much looking at promoting innovation in this particular field. Um, provide a safety requirements uh, any kind, to any kind of propulsion, can not just stop any of you already working on it, we want to be fast, and but provide you with all the safety requirements ahead. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, provide safety requirements within the aircraft or on its own, king or on its own. I personally don't have this be any surprise here. I think we'll have to wait to what the final decision is uh, within uh, the expert community in our agency. And of course, to harmonize with other authorities. I mentioned earlier, I work with CAC, which certainly will continue to, and as well as with any other authority that wishes to um, share with us um, an exchange. Um, we want to have a technology agnostic. We don't want to make choices. Um, and we want a non-restrictive objective um, with special conditions. Um, so I give you, this is also a way to how we coordinating the things. So I mentioned earlier why I talked about the VTOL as well, is here you see it at the second here. Um, and within the VTOL today, you will see that uh, as result 2400, uh, they are written that says each aircraft engine propeller, you must be type certified or meet accepted specifications. Now again, most of you working on VTOL probably were happy or not, but at least we got the VTOL special condition out. And then as soon as you see 2400, you have to get your propulsion certified because of the regulation. Therefore, again, we need to accompany you and provide you uh, with indication of how to. Now, this will come up with uh, the, new, uh, the new special condition. And with it, uh, one of the things we are trying also to uh, put together is a database uh, for accepted means of compliance that will come with it. Okay. Now, this is an approach um, <clears throat> that uh, we trying to gather uh, to make it simpler. So today, many projects look very different. Um, we want to build some sort of consistency between projects that can stand out when looking at it, and then learn as doing. Did you see this mentioned earlier? about the idea of more experience and in, in different words, but learning as we do. Um, so the idea of this database is for it to be common to both electric and hybrid projects, flexible, adaptable, and easily updated. Um, they will be harmonized with other authorities as well. Um, is a concept, again, just a concept um, for you to, to see how this works. I mean, it's a standard database, and no, uh, no, um, oh, I forgot the word I was going to say. Uh, no Bitcoin ledger here. It's just a database, what you can see here. Um, and um, this is how today is being, is being conceived. And uh, finally, the way 
straightforward. Um, so this is how we see the work uh, progressing from EASA. I can only speak for EASA, of course. So we have up there uh, the, uh, the endorsement uh, by uh, us, uh, our management. And now we're we'll moving towards the proposal coming soon. Uh, we welcome, as I mentioned, we received, over, I think, I believe over 1,000 comments to our previous proposal. If I'm here to tell you that we are going to release it soon, I also hope that you take note and you also read it and provide uh, your comments. Um, so, I think that, that will be from me. And now, before I finish, um, I just you know, take the opportunity that I'm here to talk to you, not just as a hazard rep, but as a aviation enthusiast and, and high tech. Um, I think, unlike many uh, revolutions uh, that we've seen in aviation, particularly electric propulsion and all this urban air mobility has brought in a lot of new ideas. And I think it's great. It's also driven a lot of investment in some of it that is not necessarily knowledgeable about aviation returns, uh, investment, and the like. Um, now, I may be stating the obvious here, but um, as somebody who's been in the industry uh, for a bit, I think we all need to be uh, conscious that we cannot afford uh, a mishap on this. I think this is an industry that is built, I heard Mr. Shu talk about the word honesty and integrity several times. Uh, it, is, it is an industry built on that, built on trust, uh, built that our, a trust that our citizens uh, that we understand is very difficult machines to understand, and therefore our citizens trust us for doing this. Uh, see, I was thinking while preparing these words that you know, we can't, are we not an industry that issues a mobile phone, the battery explodes, and that's okay. We go replace it, or an airbag that doesn't work in the case of a car accident, you replace it. Again, you may take a bit of a hit, um, but the industry doesn't get affected, perhaps the company does, but the industry doesn't. Um, we are more like the nuclear industry, really, um, if you think about it. If something goes wrong, it, goes, it can go very wrong. For all of you that have been in aviation for 20, 30, 40 years, this is obvious, we are. For those newcomers, again, it's great to have new blood and new ideas and to tell us you can do things better, which of course, you know, we're welcome. But again, don't hesitate in asking the right questions, in talking to people. Don't take risks, don't go, don't take shortcuts, just do the right thing because it's gonna have an impact on all of us. So with this, um, I'd like to thank you all again for being here uh, on behalf of the European